Well, hello, and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show, episode 59. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host for this edition. Got a few news items to talk about today, uh, so uh, figured I could squeeze in a quick recording, uh, even though I'm doing a lot of family stuff this week. I had a bit of time today to sit down and record the show, so let me get right into some of the stories I'll talk about today. First story today involves the EU Commission. Now they're calling for 1 million charging stations, and this is to help complete their uh, carbon uh, or climate neutrality plan and goals by 2050. So they'd like to increase charging stations by 1 million as early as 2025, really to relieve citizens of their fear of range. Uh, range anxiety is still one of the number one fears that we are experiencing today. Uh, when we talk to people, it's not the only thing about EVs that people are concerned about, but that is the main one. Um, really, it's a long list of goals. So this is part of a long list of goals to, uh, alongside the expansion of charging pillars as well and different um, elements across the uh, EU. So just a quick story to say that things are happening. You know, governments and agencies are recognizing the need that we do have to do something to combat climate change. And that electrification is a good use or is a good uh, tool to you to utilize for combating climate change. So stay tuned and we'll see more stuff popping up across Europe as far as charging infrastructure goes. Now on that note on charging infrastructures, EV networks are to increase and install 42 ultra-fast charging sites in Australia. And I know Australia is having a time on trying to spur EV adoption. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of incentives and government support there, but there are a lot of willing people because I get emails and comments all the time for people in Australia. Thank you very much for that. This project received $15 million uh, Australian dollars in funding from uh, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. So I'm not sure if that's a private or, or public foundation, uh, part of the government or not, but if it is, that's good, um, to help build these ultra-fast um, charging networks along basically most of major Australia's highway systems. So in total, there'll be 42 sites through a public-private partnership, each uh, with two 350 ultra-fast kilowatt stalls, so that's something of interest, uh, and these are to be powered via renewable sources, and the chargers will be supplied by Tritium. Uh, and these uh, charging sites, the 42 of them, will be installed at roadside service centers con connecting Adelaide, Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney, Brisbane, and plus destination charging in the far north Queensland, Tasmania, and Perth. I've uh, been to Perth, a lovely, lovely city. Uh, Perth and Adelaide and Sydney and Brisbane have been to many of the Australian cities. Construction has already commenced, uh, which is for the first site just north of Brisbane, with 23 sites to be operational in the first year. So it's a pretty aggressive timeline. It's good to see. Now, there are around 70 uh, fast charging sites today in Australia, but the number is growing quickly. And of course, Australia is a big continent and a very vast continent, and in a lot of places, a harsh continent. So it's not that easy to get reliable energy out to some of these areas. But it's good to see that Australia is making those moves to help spur EV adoption by having the infrastructure in place for them. And if you uh, have seen one of these sites uh, start going up, send me a picture and I'd love to put it on the show or send me an email with what your comments are for that. Well, we've heard about Tesla, you know, growing in sales and, and some of the other car manufacturers growing on their EV sales. But uh, there's also, of course, the supply chain element to that that really helps those automakers achieve it. And one of those major supply chain companies is CATL in China, one of the largest battery cell manufacturers in the world, not the well, not the largest, I don't think, but they're certainly there. Well, they reported some record profits in the first half of 2019. Um, they're able to basically uh, have their uh, strongest profits in maybe in history, at least year over year, very much so that it's on the increase. And they, act they contribute uh, the biggest sales driver for this continues to be the business with electric car batteries. Well, no, no figure. We know that electric car sales are climbing and there's a need for batteries. So we need suppliers to step it up. The sales for the first half of 2019 rose by 116.5% to about 20.3 billion billion won or 2.8 billion dollars US and profits uh, are up by 130% to around 2.1 billion won or uh, 293 million dollars US 83% from the battery uh, power systems division or, or power battery systems division so in the past 12 months, uh, CATL has greatly expanded its production as well. It's increasing its production from 13.8 gigawatt hours a year to 30 gigawatt hours. So more than doubling their production to handle the increase in uh, battery uh, EV needs. Um, 
So really, uh, that's all I wanted to say about that is that if you're concerned about some of these supply chain companies and maybe not fending so well to be able to continue to push out uh, the integral parts and components and powertrains and batteries for EVs, uh, I wouldn't be worried about them because they are making money as long as they can continue to ramp up and invest and uh, continue to build out their process. We should see a lot more EVs on the road. And another article that came across my eye because I've been looking at some Canadian very similar articles is the employment sector in the EV uh, landscape. And that uh, that kind of goes unannounced because there's so much attention given to your standard automakers. And of course, they're all, with the exception of Tesla, pushing their standard ICE uh, car variants for the most part. You know, some have more uh, battery and, and plug-in hybrid and hybrid vehicles than others. But for all intents and purposes, they are still very much so internal combustion vehicle manufacturers and a lot of the jobs that are talked about in the auto sector are relative to that particular marketplace well yes it is true that jobs in ice v manufacturing do outnumber jobs in other manuf building other types of vehicles however in 2018 the employment of plug-in vehicle sector specifically surpassed 120,000 uh, jobs so jobs and uh, people working and that's higher than people working on hybrid conventional cars or just hybrid cars and if you're not sure of the difference uh, watch one of my older shows where I've gone through it or go online and just google you know all battery versus plug-in hybrid versus hybrid because there is a difference uh, when I say hybrid I'm not talking about just your pure uh, Prius hybrid I'm talking about a plug-in hybrid I always look for anything with a plug and that's the key differentiation that I focus on um, so according to uh, the Department of Energy from the U.S., the uh, sector has increased in jobs and it's up uh, by over 3% to 2.4 million for types of uh, automotive jobs in renewable uh, energy and those type of sectors. And when you focus into the motor vehicle as com component parts, the jobs that are directly related to plug-ins, so anything with the plug, as I just said, amount to about 121,000. That's up 26% year over year, um, which is more than even hybrids, which saw growth for 110,000 jobs, and they grew by 10%. So there is this shift in plug-in versus conventional hybrid. Uh, we are seeing that conventional hybrids are becoming less and less. And, and my thought on that is good because it does need, we need to get rid of conventional hybrids at some point in time. We need to either go plug-in or and or all battery electric, which is the preferred model, of course. So these two categories are the quickest growing ones, the plug-in hybrid and the battery electric vehicle uh, category. And so just to give you an overview again on the motor vehicles and components parts employment in 2018, these are US only numbers. ICE, which is gasoline, diesel kind of engines, uh, just over 2 million jobs, which saw an increase of only 1.4%. BEV um, was um, uh, 68,000 and, and PHEV was 53,000 to get that 120,000 number, both up around 20, uh, over 20% to over 30% in those categories. Then you've got natural gas, uh, fuel cell vehicles and others other manufacturers, which are all single digits as far as growth goes. So that is the growth sector and continue to watch that because that basically, this is a snapshot of what's going on around the world. It's not just US centric. In Canada, we're getting more green type jobs. And I know a lot of the presidential candidates in the US are platforming on creating more of a green environment. And this is, this is some factual number to show that it is happening. So uh, stay tuned for that. It's all good news. Got a quick update from Polestar. They've announced that they've achieved World Manufacturer Identifier and they've opened a new production center. Uh, and what that World Manufacturer Identifier does is just it basically says to the world that, look, these guys are a standalone vehicle manufacturer. I guess it took them some time after the formation of Polestar to actually go through the process to get that accreditation and that certification, which they've now achieved as a standalone vehicle manufacturer. And they've opened up a state-of-the-art uh, manufacturing facility in China. It's in uh, Chengdu, China. It has opened on schedule and it's going to start production of the Polestar 1. Now, it'll, it will produce both vehicles, the Polestar 1 and 2, at some point, but it's going to start with the 1. And global exports with first customer deliveries are expected before the end of this year for the Polestar 1. So that's their kind of more expensive coupe offering, a very beautiful car. 
600 horsepower, uh, a ludicrous amount of torque, 740 foot-pounds or something like that. It's a pretty expensive car. Uh, so that'll be made in China. And the production center aims to be uh, one of the most environmentally responsible factories in China too, following a lot, I guess, of what Tesla does and some of the, our other auto manufacturers, where they've gone and achieved Gold Elite certification, uh, which is a global recognizable uh, certification in a lead rating standpoint for uh, leadership in energy and environmental design. So it's good to see that. And uh, they're predicting that 500 Polestar 1 cars will be planned, uh, will be built per year. So this is a very limited run of their vehicles of their higher end vehicles I believe there's there are these are like a hundred and twenty to hundred fifty thousand dollar US cars so you know certainly not going to be cheap um, and uh, with a total of 1500 planned over a three-year production cycle at the start and then the Polestar 2 will start to get into production uh, in, uh, in in China in early 2020 reservations of course are already going, going happening on the Polestar 2 um, and of course I'll be attending hopefully hopefully I'll be attending a, a launch event coming to Toronto uh, some a media event sometime next month so I'll get more coverage and more info on Polestar but uh, hey it's good to see that they're taking the right steps to do what they have to do to be able to start producing these vehicles and uh, all the indications are there's they're right on track to their plans and it looks like they've got a very solid vehicle which is going to be a, a really great addition to the all-electric marketplace sticking with auto manufacturer news bmw ix3 is back in the news quickly there have been some more uh, snapshots uh, and uh, renderings of stuff or uh, spy shots going on about that we do know that the ix3 is going to be an all-electric version basically of the x3 which is an extremely popular car for a BMW, it's in that compact or that very small SUV space, uh, which is uh, really, again, nice balance of room and uh, power and, and uh, cargo space and accommodations and, and ride and all that stuff. So they are, that I think is a prime vehicle to go after that space. It's scheduled to start production in China uh, by in next year in 2020. And the car will be initially offered in European marketplaces and China, of course, but then we do assume that it, it will come to North America after that. So it could be mid to mid 2020, maybe later 2020, could even go into 2021 before we see it here in North America. But, you know, I can't pretty well drive a day without seeing a, a, an X3 somewhere. It, they're that popular, at least here in Toronto, around Can where I go in Toronto and Southern Ontario, they are all over the place. So uh, I really hope BMW can cap can hope to capture some of that market by bringing this vehicle out. Uh, some of the specs, it's supposed to be a rear wheel drive uh, uh, car, which is great uh, because don't really need all wheel drive all the time, especially in most of the marketplaces. 75 kilowatt hour battery pack projection is that um, about 400 kilometer or 250 miles of WLTP range. So you can do, you can figure out that EPA will be a little less than that, probably around 225, 230 miles. It's not a whole lot less. Uh, in fact, uh, one thing I wanted to add is a lot of these EPA ranges that are coming out, I think almost everybody that buys a BEV today, uh, an all electric vehicle, we're all experiencing ranges that are higher than the EPA. I mean, you know, uh, even in, in, in the warm summer weather I'm getting here in Toronto, I'm still starting my leaf at 260, 270 kilometers on a full charge. Um, you know, it, it, it's and nothing to this. That's over EPA ranges for the 40 kilowatt hour leaf. So I think everybody I talk to is getting really good over, you know, starting ranges, uh, at least for the for the first year or so as, you know, batteries slowly degrade. Uh, this iX3 will have a 200 kilowatt electric motor and we capable of 150 kilowatt DC fast charging. So uh, anybody knows anything more about it? Maybe they've been contacted by BMW for pre-orders or something. I don't think there's anything out yet, but when that happens, please let me know. I'd love to hear from you. And last story today is I got an email from Sonos announcing their interior design. They're starting to show off the, the final design for their Scion vehicle. Um, so I've got some images here that you're seeing. Uh, really, uh, there was a few that I put out probably earlier this year uh, when I saw some snaps and here's some more. But it really streamlined, really made their, their initial vehicle much more pleasant to the eye, uh, much more user friendly as well. It looks like a better use of materials, a little bit nicer materials and so forth. But it's a nice cockpit. You know, it's it, 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 very functional some intuitive operation, some user friendliness. It comes with connectivity. It features a 10 inch uh, central display for infotainment and then of course a seven inch display in the binnacle. Uh, will support Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. That's what I'm trying to say and all that stuff. So as you can see by these pictures still has that funky moss thing to act as a bit of a cleaner for your uh, 
uh, cabin air filter type of element, which is a uh, unique and different. Uh, it certainly, you s certainly can get in that car and think environment when you're sitting in there. That's for sure. I think it's a great idea. Now, series production is scheduled to start at the second half of next year, so uh, second half of 2020. Now, they're they're anticipating over uh, about 260,000 of these vehicles that they're going to produce over time, um, and the initial initial rollout will be delivered as a ver at a version which you're seeing here, costing about 25,500 euros, and it's a great price point and they are working to bring out other platforms as well other vehicles based on this original platform uh, including some aimed at international marketplaces so for us folks here in North America and, other, and Australia and other places um, stay tuned Sonos is looking to, to go more than just stay within the European Union or the European countries as where they're headquartered and based they're looking to go farther now I do know they've uh, reached uh, surpassed over 10,000 online reservations for the first Scion vehicle so that's great good for them I love uh, companies like Sign, which are making those steps to uh, move the uh, move the uh, the yardsticks forward and, and have a compelling offering for the masses at a really good price point. So stay tuned and continue to watch Scion. And that's it. That's the end of this show, episode 59 of the EV Revolution show, where I hope to try to educate minds one tailpipe at a time. That's my motto here with a few stories we're talking about today. Uh, again, want to remind everybody now that I said started it on the last show, fully charged live for Austin tickets are now on sale for the USA. Go check out their website for all the details. Don't forget, if you want to save 15%, 1-5% on uh, the pricing for your tickets, use my discount code EV Revolution that you see here on the screen. It is case sensitive, so please type it in as you see it uh, whenever you when you go through your checkout process there and you will get 15% off the price. Again, I thank the Fully Charged Live folks for offering me that discount code that I could pass on to viewers. And of course, this show can't be done without viewers that watch it like yourselves. Uh, I do appreciate comments through YouTube. It's a very important mechanism for me to gauge feedback on how I'm doing. And there's some very spirited conversations that are going on as well sometimes. And I do learn from every single show. I learn something from my viewers. And I very much appreciate that. That's, uh, that's great that we have that kind of dialogue. So thank you very much for that. Of course, I'm always humbled and blessed with Patreon supporters. Uh, thank you very much for your, your continued support. If you're not sure what Patreon is, I encourage you to go check out my website and, and find out a little bit more. It's basically a pledge. You pledge per month. If you want to help support the show, even a dollar a month is the minimum. It will go a long way to helping me continue to fund this show. It does take me a lot of time and effort to do each show, and I, there, I do incur costs when I travel and have to do things, um, even if it's just local. Uh, you know, I had to go do an interview with somebody, got to pay for you know 25 bucks for parking. That's all out of my pocket. All this kind of little things that you don't think about, they do tend to add up, so I appreciate any help that I can get if you're interested. Or if you want to do a one-time donation by PayPal, that certainly can be done. Send me an email, and I will let you know how to do that, where you can send something to. But, uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't want to uh, support me financially, that's fine. If you could at least like and subscribe, or at least subscribe to the show, that would help immensely. As I work towards my goal for this year of getting to 10,000 subscribers, and I'm slowly but surely getting there. I'm very, very pleased with the progress. Uh, again, I, I, you know, I can't do this full time. This is a part-time effort for me, so I do what I can to continue moving the show and continue providing updates. Uh, for everyone. So until the next show, please again, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it a lot. Everybody, please stay safe and I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.